السلام عليكم ما شاء الله ان شاء الله welcome everybody to our uh, continuing tafsir program women in the quran اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على المبعوث رحمه للعالمين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين so um, there is some uh, claims out there that uh, Islam is oppressing women and that women have a low status in Islam and um, the truth to that statement is that unfortunately there are Muslims in Muslim countries some more than others that standardize a treatment of women that would be seen as oppressive oppression and um, have an attitude that women are lesser or not uh, on the same level and that's actually found in the tafsir books as well you can read very prominent tafsirs, Ibn Kathir and Ibn al-Arabi and many great scholars of the mainstream that said الرِّجَالُ يُفَضَّلُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ مِنْ أَوْجُ You know that men are preferred and they are better by gender than women in many ways. Of course that's their opinion because um, nowhere did the Prophet ﷺ of the Qur'an or the Sunnah say such a, a statement like that. Um, so what we're going to talk about today specifically is the lofty place of the mother and uh, the wife in the uh, Qur'an and in some of the commentaries from the scholars uh, and the hadith of the Prophet If we have time, we'll try to uh, dig into the controversy of spousal abuse as well as uh, polygamy. You know what polygamy is, right? What's the difference between polygamy and polygamy? The, uh, husbands and polygamy wives. is either way male or female having more than one spouse. Yeah. Um, so we don't have that in our tradition or as far as I know, no tradition had that to my knowledge. Um, I know that many Christian groups have had polygamy, um, uh, but not uh, polygamy. So our mothers, as we said before, the famous ayah, it's mentioned in Surah Al-Ahqaf and Surah Luqman. In Surah Luqman he says, وَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنِ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ We have commanded the people to honor their parents above all. Meaning, of course, as Muslims we have character and we're told to have good character with all people and that the best of character and manners and etiquettes are the people who are closest to the Prophet ﷺ in this life and eternity. But what's being emphasized here in this verse and in many verses is that the parents among all people deserve more respect and good character than the rest. The highest level of focus on these things. So then the next thing is called Jumla Tafsiriya in Arabic. حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا that an explanation or a justification, jumla ta'liliya, is that the mother, okay, uh, go through, their mothers go through much pain and hardship to carry them, to give birth to them, and to nurse them for two years. So what we're learning from this verse is that the, just, the, the primary justification that Allah is giving for why we should respect our parents is because of the mother is because the mothers hold a special role in that um, God has preferred the woman to be a mother over a man in order to have this special connection uh, with God and creation that no other uh, being can have. Um, so the scholars mention in this tafsir the famous hadith about man ahaqqu bi ahsan li suhbati, right? So who is most rightful for my best character and companionship in my interactions with them? And we know the hadith. Mother, 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 and then the father. And so, as Imam Al-Qutubi said, he said, the right and the priority of the mother over the father is three times that of the father. And so some scholars, like Imam Al-Alusi, they talked about how this was something that God has chosen the woman over the man um, to be able to feel creation inside of your body and to give birth to it and to have that connection is something that you know no man will ever understand um, no matter how much 
So basically, God creates everything by will. We are all existing and everything is existing because God is bringing it. So amongst human beings, those that are closest to that is the mothers. Um, so there's a famous hadith uh, which says in Bukhari, إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمَ عُقُوقَ الْأُمَّهَاتِ He said it like that. And there is no hadith uquq al-abab. It's just uquq al-walidayn is another one. But, and so that's something, takhsis min al-am, you feed it tawqeed. And the scholars, they've said that when you specify something from a general group, and you take one category out, then that indicates emphasis on this group in their place and in their status and stature. So that's what this hadith is saying, is that God has prohibited disrespecting mothers um, more so than fathers. Now, here's the dilemma. Raise your hand if you have not heard the hadith that heaven is at, under the footsteps or at the footsteps of the mother. Raise your hand if you did not hear that hadith. If this is the first time, raise your hand. First time you heard it, raise your hand. Okay, that hadith, la yasih bihad. This is not authentic hadith. Actually, it's mawdu'ah. It's, it's a fabricated narration. This is just one other example that I'm, I'm going to keep giving these examples to show that what you have heard and what everybody says and what the khutaba have said time and time again is not necessarily the true religion of Islam. It's customarily taken in preaching that sounds beautiful and agrees with some authentic texts. So somebody might say, yani, huwa sahih ma'nan. But they say it's a hadith. It's not a hadith. It is not acceptable as a hadith. So um, we know that from these texts, we owe our mother more than our father because of these reasons. And that's what we should say when somebody asks us. If you start saying, and if you, I looked it up, I found it on so many websites. Mainstream websites, Arabic, English. So the first reason about mothers is that the heaven is at their feet. Then you look up all of the hadith scholars and what they have said about the chain of narration. There's all kinds of broken chains and, and narrators that are rejected and all these things. So this is where we have to be careful about where we take our religion from and review our religion. We should not just assume that whatever we heard is Islam, alhamdulillah, we know. We should assume that maybe there's things that were passed down that were not correct or need to be authenticated. And the need to have a text to base your belief and practice and what you teach and promote is important, very important. This idea, don't question the teacher or the parent, what we said goes, this is not correct Islamic methodology. So the famous hadith, إِذْ قَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ عِمْرَانَ رَبِّ إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطْنِي مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Going back to the mother of Mary. How did Mary become such a special thing? So somebody might say, well, it's divine decree. God has willed it, He has planned it, and so forth. But if you look in what we know from the asbab, uh, uh, the uh, free choice of the human being, it all goes back to her mom. And it's very important the way we look at children uh, and how we see our responsibility with that. So it says, remember when the wife of Imran, she prayed, Oh my Lord, I have vowed what is in my womb entirely for your service. And I'm completely giving my child in my womb to your service. So please accept that from me, uh, surely you are the one who knows and hears all. And the next ayah, she gave birth to the child, and she's like, well now I have given birth to a girl, and the male is not like the female. So God is making the point to her, Wallahu a'lamu bima wadat. God knows very well, it was His plan what she would have, meaning it's not only men who are special and can be leaders of piety and righteousness, your Daughter will be a sign for all people, as mentioned in another ayah. Right? So this is uh, what we see, uh, is that goes back to... So when we are, uh, if, if you're pregnant, you should make this prayer. You should iqtidat bis salihat To follow the example of the righteous mothers and say, you know what, I'm dedicating into service the child in my womb. Because we're talking about a miraculous prophet who led an amazing example and was gifted with all these miracles, who will come back to be a sign of the end times, bring the whole world under the peaceful banner of a divine love and connection amongst each other. Allahu Akbar. 
And this came from this special prayer. And that's the secret of the prayer. رَبَّنَا هَبَلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيْنٍ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا When we're having a child, we're thinking, Oh, our Lord, make our spouses and our children uh, the delight or the coolness of our eyes. Meaning, the thing that makes us most happy. And what should that be? وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا That we are leaders amongst the pious. That we become examples of your... See, uh, muttaqeen are those who are mindful of God. Meaning, we lead by example that quality. That's what we're looking for. Now let me ask you, how many of you, with your children, male or female, and we have a lot of interesting things to talk about, and I have some interesting researches I've done that I can post on the website that are somewhat unique. Not in history of Islam, but in modern thinking. So if we're going to have a child, how many think... I want my son to become a scholar of the religion of Islam. I want my son to be a great Imam and Da'i. Call people the truth. And I'm going to focus that that's what I want out of my child. You have many people that want their kid to memorize the Qur'an in too many cases without really knowing the language of it or becoming you know, leaders of the Salah or doing much. That's you know, a very small step to becoming a scholar. I mean actually in our history Kids were learning the Quran 9, 10, 11 years old. That was a very beginning baby step. We're looking at that as that's the ultimate goal. You see, that's the new attitude we have. So scholarship is a whole reality. Now, should we have female scholars? We should have female scholars. I'll never forget, um, uh, uh, there's a sheikh named Basyuni Nahla. Um, he is a uh, Azhar scholar, um, and he is uh, teaching graduate studies right now in Qatar. He teaches, uh, he oversees masters and, and he teaches master classes and PhD for uh, fiqh al muqarab comparative fiqh. So he used to be the imam, the main imam at ISBCC, the Islamic uh, Boston Cultural Center, which is big $15 million amazing uh, center on Malcolm X Boulevard, mashallah of all places in Boston. Um, so whenever I was coming back from Florida, I was looking into that job and we were talking and I'll be honest with you. He was telling me, he was like, I just want to get your idea. If you become the imam here, are you comfortable with female imams? And I was like, is this some sort of trick? <laughs> what are you talking about, Sheikh? He was like, you know what I mean. And I was like, I'm really, I've never heard about that one before. <laughs> I was like, Sheikh, I mean, what is this? I, of course I don't think. He was like, no, I'm not, I'm not saying a female who would lead the salah or she would give the khutbah on Friday. What I'm saying is, a female religious scholar and leader who will give talks and be a reference of knowledge and leadership in the community. And I was like, well, should we call her Imam? He was like, well, I'm talking in terms of American terminological usage of it, not in terms of the Arabic, is Islamic world usage of it. Man, I was a little bit confused at that point. I just said, I'm going to take a job in Florida and see, see how I can figure it. That's come too complicated for me. Uh, but after that, I've actually heard other scholars mentioning this point, um, and I can make sense of it uh, scripturally and historically in our, in our tradition. Um, the scholars say, uh, The point of, of reference on judging something is not what you call it, it's what it is. So if they say, we're la riba, or we, we're ijara, okay, they use fancy Islamic terms. And you think, oh, mashallah, this is the Arabic Islamic term, so this contract must be halal. No. You have to study the contract, and then decide based upon the contract, not what they call it. You see what I'm saying? So that's basically that. Somebody may say, I'm Muslim. And then they do all kind of things and say, I really don't believe in this ayah or that ayah. Right? You see what I'm saying? So that's where we, we look at things like that. I got, I got a question. Sure. Uh, is there a reason why she was referenced as the wife of Amnon? Do we know her name? Uh, yeah, and it's not important. And that's one of the things that the scholars mentioned about many ayahs in the Quran. And you'll find that as a student of the Bible versus the Quran. So the Bible goes long detail into detail. <laughs> This one from that village, this one, the son of this one, and this way they lived in this time and in this place, and they had neighbors called such and such and all. Okay, but what are, where's the guidance? What is the, is this a history book about some village, right? So the Quran tends to focus on what's important. If the name really does carry some significance, um, for sure, 
there is nothing wrong with mentioning a woman's name. The surah is Maryam, right? And the Prophet ﷺ and the, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ used to call our mothers by their name. So we know that's not wrong. Now, maybe a whole society, like for example, many Muslim countries have a culture that it's not seen as respectful or good to call a, a woman by her name. If they say that's Islam, they're making an innovation, which is, which is not acceptable. If they say customarily we're comfortable with this, then we respect the culture of people. You see what I'm saying? So, it's when it becomes forced as a religious doctrine, that becomes wrong, right? So Islam focuses on things that, that have meaning and importance, and the story and the, the guidance from it. So if there was a name, it was very important. Like for example, is Fir'aun, is his name Fir'aun? No, I mean, I don't know, is he King Tut, is he Ramses, or who, they have all these ideas about who this guy was, right? We keep calling him Fir'aun, like, like Abu Lahab was not a guy named Abu Lahab, right? <laughs> so these are things that we, we learn. So the amazing examples of leadership in our mothers, starting with the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we see it, we see it. So on many occasions, um, Khadija was a great leader to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was the mother of six of his kids, and his only wife he knew for all of his years as a young man that men would, you know, be looking for a, that type of a relationship. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was deeply emotionally and psychologically taken aback by meeting the angel Gabriel. Narrations that are reliable, so he got, you know, felt like maybe he'd been afflicted by the demons or that he wanted to commit suicide. He comes to his wife Khadija and she's like, no, don't pay any attention to that. Here's what I know. Here's who I know you to be. Here's how I believe God to be. And you know what? I know a cousin that he might be able to help us. She took a role of leadership in that situation that the Prophet ﷺ very much needed. And we'll get to some of the texts that tell us about the importance of leadership. So, uh, Hafiz Ibrahim, the great uh, Egyptian poet, he said, Al Ummu Madrasa, wrote a whole poem. Al Ummu Madrasa. The mother is a school. A mother is a school. Meaning, if anyone is going to teach a child, and the child is going to grow up and be something special, if the mom is not there doing it, or doing it right, it's a big disaster. That's the beginning of all education, is with the mother. So you hear, Ummul Kitab, Fi Ummul Kitab, Ummul Quran, the mother of the book, the mother of the villages or the cities. The scholars have said that these are the most holiest and the greatest. So the word used for most holy and most great is Um, mother. This is a very, very significant word. Could have said Ab. So I'm, I'm, I'm using the Quran to negate the claim that in Islam, male is better than female and we know that from some reason. I would suggest that in history, scholars would always be affected by their culture. I would say that the ideas that I'm having right here first came in my culture, and then I looked in the scriptures, and I found them there, agreeing with my culture, in some ways. In some ways, obviously not. And so we stick with uh, a tawqif. Whatever the scripture has come with, we will accept it. But for sure, your culture will push you in a direction. If you become very biased or ethnocentric, then you will not look further. You will look for one justification for what you think, and you will shut down. And then you will want to sh shut off to any other conflicting narrations within the scripture. So it's important for us to look at everything and take a holistic, balanced approach in which we, we become truly objective, seeking faith on terms of scripture, and not allowing culture to dominate scripture. Because culture is the actions of human beings, uh, with flaws and so forth. I think they have a room for child care. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's okay, child. I'll you. Inshallah. So, uh, so that's where we have to be um, authentic in our religion and not just go along with what we've heard. Uh, so then you have the famous ayah. Um, in Surah Taha, 
says, قَالَ يَبْنَ أُمَّ لَا تُؤْتَخُذْ بِلِحْيَةِ وَلَا بِرَأْسِ He said, Aaron is talking to Moses here, um, O oh son of my mother, don't grab me by my beard and my head. Because what do we know that Moses is doing? Yeah. Now, some people are taught that to say that is some sort of disrespectful thing to Moses. It's the Qur'an, man. I'm not saying it. The Qur'an saying it. I'm explaining this, this fact to you. Moses got very angry. For a good reason. And so Moses decide, or Aaron decides, alayhi salam, how's the best way to bring compassion and mercy out of my brother? Let's refer to him as the son of my mother who cared for us and loved us uh, when we were young. And what his mother has done for him and how Allah has brought him back is an, an amazing miracle. So the, fam the, 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 the probably the conclusion of this one, Khitam al-Misk, the famous hadith al-Qudsi, which God said, Ana rahman He said, I am the beneficent, the all-beneficent, compassionate, merciful one. الرحم, and I created the womb. Isman min ismi, and I gave the womb in the mother a description from my description. Whoever would keep the tie to that womb, meaning everything that comes out of it, they feel a very important special bond, then I will keep ties with that person. Whoever would break the ties of that womb, I will break ties with them. What he's saying is, the most significant description he has in relation to human beings, Rahma, compassion, love, benevolence, beneficent, care, concern, forgiveness, all that fits under Rahma. Okay? He's saying that he, that goes to the womb. Of all things that exist on planet Earth, he is describing that the womb is closest to it, as we talked about before. So that's a very important uh, thing for us to remember. Uh, because if you think about it, when the child is in the womb, what does it have? There is the umbilical cord. In there is the oxygen, the air is coming. In that is the water and the nourishment, the warmth, the comfort. I remember um, one time whenever a brother had this big scare and his wife was eight months pregnant. She fell down and her stomach hit right on the corner of the table. Like that. He said, oh my God, will I pray for us? Imam, pray for us. Well, you know, our baby went in there. The doctor was laughing at him without even seeing anything. What is this? Are you crazy? You madman? He's like, the way the womb works. I mean, unless you just laid her flat and then threw down big boulders on top of her flat, it's going to always move to protect the baby. But we want to say, okay, we'll show you. Everything was fine. <coughs> the doctor said, it's going to move, right? So that, that's amazing. Comfort. You know, like whenever so people, a lot of people sleep, they need to curl up, just like they were in their mother's womb. That's the most comfortable way of sleeping. And so they call it the fetal position. Where you feel you need something, you need, they call it the fetal position, he went into the fetal, he's scared, he's concerned, he needs, this is what that is. So talk about our wives. He is the one who created you all from one soul and made a spouse for it so that he may live with her in tranquility. So we talked about, there is a difference of opinion among scholars going back to some Sahaba and some Tabi'een and that is, was this hadith about Dila, literal or metaphorical? We've talked about that before in a previous thing. So either way, the mainstream, the vast majority of scholars, they're saying it's literal. Even though if you say, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ What does that mean? You know? So there is a meaning, there is metaphors in Arabic. The human being was created from hastiness. What is a hastiness? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 
so that's some scholars differ. But it seems like here in the text, it seems easy to understand linguistically, that God created you all from one soul. And then from that soul, he created the spouse for it. Meaning what? From the same thing. him. From the same thing. That they are created to live with each other in peace and tranquility. So husband and wives were created for each other to live in peace and tranquility. Liaskunila. Sukun sakan and sakina. So sakan to live, to be in a pro uh, proximity. Sakina is the right way to live with others and yourself, just to be peaceful. And so um, that's the whole purpose. And so then the famous ayah. So this next ayah is the, the ayah of the marital bond. It's like a couple of sentences. It sums up a whole system. A whole system for the marital relationship. If you simply will understand and follow this verse, you will never have serious marital problems. Is that good? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So, from among his signs, he created for you spouses among yourselves. And we are from the same thing. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا النِّسَاءُ شِقَائِقُ الرِّجَالِ That women are the other half of men. They come from men. They are from the same thing. So, He has created your spouses from among yourselves. For what purpose? Lamb in Arabic is the lamb ta'aliliyah. It's the, for what reason? For what wisdom? لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا so, that you would go to them and feel comforted and peaceful with them. Some of the scholars have gone into some deep analysis. They said, you have to live tranquil, you have to live in a tranquil way that you feel comfortable going to each other. Ilayha too. Not maha. Maha in the same area. I've had so many couples come to me. Sometimes they've been married 20, 30 years. Imam, we just don't really have any sort of relationship. Come to find out, in marriage, people got this idea from the beginning that it's about roles. I'm man, I make money and provide, I go work, I come home, you're a woman, you cook and make babies and stay at home. These are our roles. This is what we do. There's no, this ayah is missing. The whole thing is missing, the whole point. So that's obviously not what we saw in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was the most busy guy in the history of mankind. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he was at home, he was always helping his family out, interacting with them. When people came to visit, he would go get the tea or whatever it is that they were drinking. And then he would, you know, he would fix the clothing and the sandals and go out and milk sheep and stuff. The Prophet ﷺ, he was a guy like that. Amazing person. So, uh, you live with it. So, what, who knows here, what's the best way to have a peaceful relationship with someone? I'll give you a hint. It starts with a C. Communication. Communication, mashallah. It's always going to come from the sister on this one. Because <laughs> we are disasters, brother. We have to admit, we don't get feelings and communication, even if there is not much to talk about. Brother, brother, like, I don't know what to talk about. To just feel like you're comfortable talking. The presence, that smiling face and interaction, it means so much. To get that feeling like your best friend, you feel like you can go to them. Like your best friends, like you're very comfortable. I know it's all cliche sounding. But it's real, you know. That's the Prophet uh, each of the wives felt when he was with them that they were the most beloved. And they were all jealous of Aisha. And Aisha was very jealous of Khadija. If you look, that's, I mean, she had passed away. So, radiallahu anha. So, it's because he made them feel that way. The famous hadith of Umar, radiallahu anha. He comes to the house, I told you that. Anyways, he comes to the house, and Prophet Sallallahu wives are raising their voice at the Prophet Sallallahu They're human beings, they have their shortcomings. 
So Omar is trying to go away. He starts to knock, he goes away. Prophet Sallallahu comes to the door, open up, Omar, Salaam Alaikum. He's like, you know, what do I do? He's like, come on in, no problem, man. He's all happy and there's no problem. He's like, I sound, I sound like a problem in there to me. <laughs> so then he comes in and he finds two of the Prophet Sallallahu wives, they go run behind the curtain and they just be quiet. Then he calls out to them, Ya adu wati anfusihinna. All enemies of themselves behind the curtain. <laughs> you fear me, and you don't fear that you said what the Prophet Sallallahu talking, raising your voice at him. They said, but we know that you are harsh and rigid, so we're scared of you. He's easygoing and gentle with us all the time. <laughs> Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu was the master. Very romantic kind of guy, mashallah. <coughs> Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, for the Quran tells us, وَجَعْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةِ وَرَحْمَةِ He made between you mawadda. So hub it means you're attached to it. You like it a lot. You could say you love it, but in a superficial way. Which the word love can be very superficial. So I'll try to talk to my Christian friend about this. God is love, and God is love. I said, what does that mean? So when I say compassion or mercy, those have an implied interactive meaning. Love is like some concept. Right? Like, well, you know, compassion and mercy are like ways of love. Well, okay, fine. I guess we'll meet in the middle somewhere. <laughs> so, mawadda is loving affection. A feeling like the maudud, nothing should come between me and it. So, like, hope you could really enjoy a certain dish of food. You could really enjoy um, uh, a hobby, playing basketball, ping pong, whatever. But you're not going to sacrifice anything serious in your life for these things. Whereas the maudud, you will give up anything and everything to preserve it and keep it. That's the idea. Mawadda. A deep loving affection. A constant uh, cultivation of a romantic, loving, caring, concerned environment of understanding. So, the Prophet ﷺ saw that Safiya because she had been from a Jewish family, some of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ were acting strange. So he used to go out of his way to be extra sweet to her. He's the only one that the Prophet ﷺ would put his knee and then put, she would put her foot and then he would hold her and put her up on the camel every time. And he used to be very adamant, you know. And Aisha, she would, Allah, she would mention you know, something about her time of the month. He would go out of his way to embrace her and to drink from the same place where she drank, to let her know that this does not, our mawadda is not uh, interrupted here. This is authentic hadith, by the way, Bukhari Muslim stuff. So, so then, Murahma. Murahma, I will sum it up like this Forgive and forget. Everybody's going to get a little bit. Hysterical sometimes. Voices get raised. We saw the hadith. But don't get historical. Remember that time, long time ago, what you said and what you did. Well, come on, sister, give it up, man. Bismillah. Sometimes the brother does it. But this is usually sisters have compartmentalized folders of historical realities. <laughs> and therefore, if you step into that one again, see what you did. There it is again. Live and let live. Forgive and forget. <coughs> Compromise. Rahma. Then you don't need to control. Prophet ﷺ was the best leader. They didn't feel like he was controlling them or dictatoring them. Who loves dictators? Raise your hand. No reason. So if you don't like dictators, why would you ever be a dictator towards your family? It's not acceptable. It's not Islamic. It doesn't make any sense. The good leader is basically giving power and authority and only taking some serious decision as we'll talk about shortly uh, whenever it's really big and serious and it makes some and then they'll easily give in at least most of them inshallah if, uh, otherwise I'll, I can help you out inshallah so rahma you keep forgiving and you don't make big deals you don't hold stuff in your heart you go to sleep this is my other half of my life you know I'm going to just forget about all that stuff you know, it's normal. People get annoyed and bothered and they said or did something. The voices get raised. Some harsh language happens between. It's normal. It happens all the time. Prophet ﷺ happened in his house. But you don't 
let that build up and become a mountain or perpetuate, and then you have grudges and, and uh, resentment between. Otherwise, you're not following that. I, Rahmah, forget about it, move on. That's my wife, that's my husband, we're good. In the, in the verse, basically before it, it said, women should not be uh, forced to marry uh, against their comfort zone. So this is what Ashur, regardless of once you've married, you must live with them with the, according to the highest standard of Allah. Ma'roof, all the good things of religion and character. and un, So Ma'roof, part of it is understanding the one to whom you are talking or dealing with. How do they think? What's their background? What kind of things they're used to? What kind of things they incline to? Which kind of things are pet peeves to them? So you're aware of all this and so you adjust to make them happy. That's what it means. Ashiruhunna bin Ma'roof. The best among you are the best toward your wives, the Prophet said. I think that sums it up uh, for that angle of it. Yeah. Prophet said, Min uh, sa'ada thalatha. Min sa'ada al mar. From the happiness of a man is three things. The first one he mentioned, a righteous wife. To have a righteous wife. In another narration, he said, Better than gold and silver, that you take liyattakhidh ahadukum qalban shakira. That you take a, a thankful heart. And a tongue that is moist with the remembrance of God. And a righteous wife. That she supports you and helps you in your religion and your hereafter. And the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, The best treasure a man can have is a righteous woman. If he looks at her, She makes him happy. And that means so many different things. It's like, هُنَّ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ So, um, she knows how to make you happy. She, she knows what kind of things you like. She knows what to say to you. She keeps you in a good mood as best she can. وَإِذَا أَمَرْتَهَا أَطَعَتْكَ If you asked her to do something, she did it for you. وَإِذَا غِبْتَ عَنْهَا حَفِظَتْ If you left her, she will preserve you. Your property, your... Uh, respect and who you are. She would never say anything bad about you to anyone. Things like that. <coughs> Do we have time for this one? This is pretty heavy stuff. No, this is it. We have time, man. Come on. Okay. <laughs> so, <coughs> marriage is an institution. There's no question about that. Okay. People want to break it, marriage down to some superficial relationship. It's an institution. You have a family being built on this thing called marriage. It's the nucleus of a healthy society. You have two people living together who are equal spiritual entities that could equally offer something for the value of the growth of the relationship. But at the end of the day, there will be decisions made that will affect both of them. And then the children that they will have. Somebody has to have a final say. Somebody has to be given the responsibility of leadership. If you look in the Bible, it's very clear and it's a little bit more rigid. It's more rigid than what we understand. The Bible basically said God created women to serve their husbands. That's, that's what the Bible says. And so, um, the Quran here is saying, Men have been made maintainers, is the best one. So, Allah al Qayyum. God is the maintainer of everything. Qa'im ala kulli shay bi kulli shay. He is the one who is in control of everything and He is the one who is taking care of all of the affairs, making everything the way it is. Al-Qayyum. So Ar-Rijal wa Qawwa Amun al-Nisa, they are responsible for their wives. And this is the wife. It does not mean men over women. It's in the context of a marriage here. We know that. It is not that men have some authority over women by, by virtue of gender. This is talking about, because here's the problem. In Arabic, Zawj can mean male or female. Yeah, so Prophet Allah says, قُلْنَا يَا آدَمْ أُسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ زَوْجُكَ 
So that can be male or female. You see what I'm saying? So it's going to be confusing if he says, as you know, it'll be confusing. The idea of zojat has become more of a newer nuance in the Arabic usage. Back then it wasn't like this. Because they're like a pair. They're like two of the same entity. <coughs> they're connected. So God, بِمَا فَضَّ اللَّهُ بَعْضُ وَمَا Listen to two ways of looking at this. One is, God has made men superior to women. Or, God has preferred men to have this responsibility of leading the household, of being the maintainer. One is misogynistic and it will lead to dictatorships and ruined households and messed up cultures. The other one is the actual what it means. It means God has decided, has to be one or two, one or the other is going to lead. If you're carrying children and raising them and breastfeeding them, that's a lot of work. And I don't want no part of it and I don't think I can handle it. Because that's the way God made me. So God has made me and said, you need to go out and get your butt to work, provide, be there, you know, take care of everything, try to, you know, help plan and lead and gather everybody together for what's in the best interest of this relationship. So this is the men's responsibility to be a leader in the household. And God made it a condition that men have to provide for women. It is beyond me. I have so many cases where a brother I thought, he's a practicing Muslim, and it's what I see from him. We get into a marital counseling session, and he has convinced his wife that you're going to have to pay for these bills and the house and all this stuff. And I'm like, what the heck are you doing? He's like, well, we've agreed. And I was like, was that in the contract? He's like, no. I said, then there's no agreement here. The ayah is uh, muhkama. You know, you can't do that. If the brother, mashallah, is working hard, doing whatever he does, making 30,000, 40,000, sisters, mashallah, engineer, doctor, making 150K, that's her business. That's her money. We don't own one penny. We have no right on a penny of it. It's, it's, it's the justification for our being leaders. We go out and we earn and we provide. Now, if it is agreed, that does not change the ruling here. Because they call it a tanazul al hukuk So if in the contract or thereafter, it was agreed, well, we feel in the best interest of our family that as a wife, I'm making this, I would like to contribute this. She, you would be doing that, not, well, now we have equal say-so. Because then you'll have a ruined house. Imagine if Hillary Clinton and Trump, they said, well, you won electoral, you won the popular vote, you both can have to live in the White House. You both lead equally. Male and female are equal here. Everybody's equal. It would never fly. That's why every school has a headmaster, a principal. Every restaurant has a general manager. Every business has a CEO. You know what I'm saying? This is not some foreign thing. The modern society is trying to change the order of things that doesn't make sense. It destroys families. To say, everybody has the equal say-so in everything. All you're going to do is create a perpetual war. Battle of personalities. So that's why God has given this responsibility. فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتِ The righteous wife is قَانِتَاتِ قَانِت it means obedient. And so the obedience is first to whom? God. لَا طَعْلِ مَخْلُوقْ فِي مَعْصِيَةُ الْخَالِ There can be no obedience to a creation in that which is disobedience to the Creator. This is an Islamic law maxim. It's a, it's a principle. So, then if he's asking her to do something that is not sinful, then she should do it. Uh, so, two things. If he's not at home and she's at home, he will make sure that no strange person comes in the house. And she will, if she's not with some other job, make sure that the house is in order and things like this. Not obligation, but mustahab on this one. But definitely no one can come in the house without his permission because it's his house. As we said, he provided the house. Or if you agreed, you agreed that you will help, but it's still 
the house that he has the authority over, and he has a right to say who's going to come in the house or not. Now, that being said, it is not acceptable for a man to be like, you cannot see your sister. I'm talking about brothers, so Rahim. You're going against the Quran and Sunnah now. Okay, like, you will not have your mother in this house. What are you talking about, man? It's her mom. You're going against the Quran and Sunnah. But if you're like, that strange lady that's always backbiting people don't bring her in the house, you cannot allow that girl in the house. See what I'm saying? It's all rational, it makes sense, it's reasonable. It has a point. Or this person that we've heard is always looking at people's private business and talking about it or whatever, or somebody's known to be thieving, or whatever it may be, then you can't let that person in. وَاللَّاتِ تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ There is a huge, vast difference of opinion among scholars in the history of Islam as to what does this mean. The strongest opinion is very serious rebellion to the relationship. For example, she just leaves the house, you don't know where she's at. Now that being said, who here thinks it makes sense that a woman should have to tell her husband exactly where she's at at all times, but the man can just go wherever he wants? Who thinks that makes sense? It doesn't make any sense. You should have the same thing, right? So it's talking about, like if say for example, the wife just went out somewhere, we don't know where she's at. Or say for example, witnesses say, yeah, she was just uh, sitting down smiling and laughing with some strange guy. And they were just spending time together alone in some place or something like this. Or she's inviting strange people in the house, or whatever it may be. One, actually, some of the narrations are on this point, with the same wording of this. One of them in Hijjat al Wada that's authentic. It says, Yati ahad ila al furush, or something like this. That if some guy was in the bed room with her, some scholars, there are a group of scholars who say it's specific to this type of thing. Because there's some hadith that would indicate that's what it's talking about. But I think the thing is about a serious rebellion. It's like, you know, so then what you should do is, the first thing that any believing man should do. Now, this word is very divinely. Literally chosen for the wisdom that it represents. Allah, al Allah, is something that softens the heart and helps you to remember your purpose and your accountability to God. So it's like a sitting down and a concern carrying, you know, discussion about here's some ayahs and a hadith, or here's what I'm concerned about why you're acting like this and saying this, please let's. Let's, let's come together and have a better relationship. So, what is understood according to the majority of scholars is that these next things are about immediate, like the same thing keeps happening. Like, the next day, the same thing happens again. Some scholars said you would, depending on the severity of it, continue with the adha. But if it looks like it's bad or serious and you feel it's going to destroy the marriage, then you should avoid the relationship and the, uh, the bed at night. Stay in a different room, something like this. There is a hadith in Sayyid Muslim yeah. about this topic. Yeah. Uh, if you want, I can show you. I don't know if it's a Zayif hadith or... Uh, what, what, what's the, what are we adding to the ayah here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the topic you have right now yeah, yeah, yeah. is related to similar uh, topic. Let me see. I can find that. Go ahead and try to find it. We're you talking about what we know from. Better than me, you know. Yeah. But are you saying that I've said something's wrong? Is that no, what you're suggesting? Yeah, it's uh -huh. more clear about this topic. That this is the ayah in the Quran. No, no, I, I show you that. Yeah, yeah. that you, yeah. Go ahead, bring up the hadith, maybe you can add some value yeah, to what yeah. we're talking about, inshallah. So that's what this is, that you would not stay in the second. So after that, then, you know, if it happens the next day, and it's really serious, and you could stay away from it. I'm not, you know, and then you make it clear. But then there's another hadith that says you cannot do that in public. It has to be in the home. It's not something you would bring the children into this problem and let them know about it. It is a very disastrous thing. 
for parents to quarrel in front of children. It ruins those children and it pits them against the parents. Usually it pits the child against the mom because the child has identified that the father is an aggressive, powerful figure in the household and so then you see them disrespecting their mom. So, because they feel like he's disrespecting her, which should never be, under any circumstance. Mm -hmm. so, okay, I'll make sure that it's... Go ahead and just read it for us. No, I just make sure that it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, you can read it if you sure. think it's, it's related to that. Yeah, this is talking about al-tala'un, uh, 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 you know, al-li'an. So basically... Is it a different topic? A different topic. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But there is hadith that, you know, it's about uh, promiscuity and things like that. Some, some hadith. That. This one is basically the guy, what would you do? Which, this hadith that he brought, just so that everybody's crystal clear in Sahih Muslim, because it does bring some value. It is 100% evidence outside of the general evidence that vigilantism in Islam is haram. For any person to decide, I'm going to enforce some law and I will kill someone because I deem them a criminal. What they are calling honor killing is absolutely against Islam from beginning, middle to end. And anyone who did that is a murderer who will find themselves in the hellfire. Uh, so, uh, what that hadith is saying that some guy asked the Prophet, What if I came to my house, my wife was with some other person? And then, what do I do? The Prophet said, You bring her to me. And then you will say, This is what I saw. And then, yes, it's mentioned in Surah the Nur, by the way. So, you mention what I saw, and then you swear, and then this one, if I'm lying, then the curse of God is on the liar, and the curse. Then they get separated, they can never marry again. And they can never be interacting with each other again. That's what the Prophet said about finding someone in the actual act. Imagine what we see in these Muslim countries where they're saying, I thought or I heard of or there was a love thing happening and all of that. And therefore these guys are murderers and they're absolute disgraces to Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those people who are imams around that, that do not speak up in such strong terms like I'm using, they're all disasters and disgraces to the religion in and of itself and promoting falsehood and evil. And they have no right leading any salah up in front of anyone. We need to just finish this one. And that didn't start with Muslims. They have been doing this in Japan for a long time, long before Muslims were Muslims. And in South America, they had many laws in the books up until the late 70s. Places like Colombia and elsewhere, Catholic laws that if a man decided to kill his wife, he cannot be held accountable as a murderer because of this reason. So it's not specific to us, but unfortunately we have Muslims thinking that that has some place in the religion. Back to this one. The second one, as we said. Now the third one is the big controversial thing. Wadribuhunna. So I was having a discussion with some other imams on this one, and they feel like this is very difficult to explain. And after, you know, lots of research from different tafsirs and so forth, I don't find it difficult to explain. Objectification of your knowledge and explanation thereof, and just seeking the pleasure of God and not worrying what people think, it will give you peace. The feeling like I have to please someone's culture is the problem. Okay? So the first thing we learn about wadribuhunna, in Arabic, let me give you some meanings of darb. Darb historically means something that will get your attention. 
right? It's mentioned all through the time in the Quran, God Yadrib Amthal. He strikes parables to get your attention and make you really think about what is being said. You see what that word means? Here's another thing. Look at this. Aldrib al Tawla. Or, if I took all my might and smashed it in half, that's Dharb. Dharban Shadida. Dharban Khafifa, Dharban Shadida. So, when this ayah was revealed, and by the way, the way it happened was some uh, lady came to the Prophet and said, uh, my husband has hit me and this and that. He said, لِنَقْتَصْمِنْ The immediate response from the Prophet ﷺ, uh, before this ayah was revealed, when a woman said, a man has hit me in some way, my husband has hit me. He said, let's go bring qisas. Like when Umar found out that uh, the son of Amr bin al-As has um, hit a Christian who was beating him in a race on a horse and he was mocking him saying that I am the son of the noblest man in this place Omar called for them and he told the Christian guy here's the here's a little whip thing go ahead and hit Mr. Nobler most noble of the noblest over here this is called Kisas and we have it in our scripture if somebody punched you in your nose and broke your nose Islamic law will allow you to break their nose so we call it Al-Mu'amala bil it's in the Quran. And that's fair. It's justice. So the Prophet said, let's go take uh, retribution from this guy which. So we don't know exactly how that panned out, but we know that later on or that night or that late next day, God revealed this verse. And it's more of a system and it teaches. So then somebody said, when that verse was revealed, the Prophet said, Darban غير مبرح. It is a type of physical reprimand that is non-violent. A tabrih in Arabic, it means to come with a rage and to hurt and injure and to break bones and leave bruises and cut. This is tabrih, mubarrah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, a type of physical reprimand that is non-violent. And then in another narration, days later, the, according to the chronology of this whole thing, some women came and they said, some of the husbands are doing this, and the Prophet ﷺ, he said something like, um, who would treat his wife like an animal that he's trying to get that animal to act right? Meaning whenever you're on a horse and you hit him, even till today we're hitting the horse on the butt to get him to go. Like that. He said, you're not injuring the horse. But you're slapping him, right? And then in another narration he said, uh, These are not the best among you, those that take this option. So we know that according to Aisha radiallahu anha, the Prophet sallallahu never applied this verse. And we know in the Prophet sallallahu life that he divorced Hafsa. And we know that he left the house and went to the mosque for a month whenever he was having issues. This is his example. Right? So whenever it says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا اللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ And the Messenger of God is the best example. So when Aisha said, the Prophet ﷺ never hit anyone. He didn't hit a woman, a child, a servant, or an animal. He, if somebody was called to a battlefield against an enemy uh, military, he would go fight them to defend the rights of the believers. So that's the best example. And he's saying this is the best example. So now someone might say, well, why would Allah put this in here? Because he did, it would be allowable for which cases it will benefit. Sheikh Abu Bakr al Jazairi, one of the great scholars of our day, he's a teacher in Medina, has been for about 40, 50 years. He's been having a chair where he teaches in Medina. I had the opportunity a couple of times to sit with him. And listen, he's a very old man. MashaAllah, Allah Yaitawul Amrahu Fil Khayyib Al Barakah. He has his book, uh, I think it's Aisar Al Tafasir, um, it's where he explains this ayah and he said, We find, and so Umar once he said, In Mecca our wives were very 
the custom was they were very respectful to us. And we found that the women here in Medina are very courageous and audacious. And our Meccan wives are learning from them. So it's very well known that one time Omar was like um, telling his wife, I would prefer you to, to stay at home. She said, I'm going to the mosque. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you cannot prevent the female servants of God to go to the mosque, so I'm going. And Omar said, okay. What are you going to do? It's scripture. It's not about battles of personality or control and all that. So, um, Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Jazai, he said, he said, the law has come for the purpose of bringing about individual and social welfare and to avert individual and social harm and corruption. That's the whole law. That's why it's made. So he said, if you know that in your culture to try to apply this verse in this way will create more problems than it will solve, then you should not use this verse. This is what we call istihsan. Or These are Islamic legal principles that all the scholars have agreed upon exist. Yes? This is absolutely wrong. To say beat them is a false tafsir. Now you can see where we're at as an ummah in the American or the English Western thing. If you bought 50 translations of the Qur'an, you're going to get about 20 of them will say and beat them. And then you're going to get 30 of them that says something even more absolutely ridiculous and beat them lightly. You ever had a light beating? You ever heard of a light beating? Beating is a beating! It hurts and it's bad and it's harmful and what the Prophet said don't do. There's no such thing as a light beating. So, uh, some scholars now, you know, like Sheikh Imam Majid, mashallah, he's convinced that uh, al-darb is a tafriqa al-abadiyya. And he, there is Imam Suyuti he said this in his tafsir, by the way. That to completely, yani darb to, darb safhan jadida, start over, you know, like that. He said like that. So, to separate them finally, meaning to get to divorce. And that's why the beginning of the next verse, it says, when khiftum shiqaqa bainihima. Meaning if you think now that they're going to be divorced, then bring some arbitrators and try to fix it. If they want to get it fixed, God will help them. If not, then they need to be just divorced. But look at the end of the ayat. If they would respectfully uh, respond to your concerns, and they would be respectful to you, um, then do not seek any recourse. What we will learn from the scholars is that it's not like, you know, Last month you did this and now you're doing this, so now it's not in the same bedroom. What are you talking about? And by the way, some of the Hanafi jurists said that it can be used either way. But the Sultan, because they have the Quwa, they're the ones that can, you know, for example, there is some Hanafi scholar said, the sister comes in and she has been beat, this is a Qisas. So anytime the sister got a bruise, she can come, and then... And my advice to any sister is, if some guy is hitting you or bruising you, you need to call the police immediately. We will support you as a center. MCC will support you, take her back. Brother needs to know, you don't ever put your hand on your woman. Ever. That is not acceptable, under any circumstances. There is no beating. Whatever it was, I don't get it. I'm American. Culturally, they had something in the time of the Prophet, Arabia, someplace in Africa, where if the brother would take her by the arm or poke her in a way, or one hadith mentioned by Ibn Abbas said, with the miswak. It's an authentic hadith that he took the miswak and went like that. Meaning, you know, like flicker, like this. For me, it seems weird. And that's cultural thing. We're talking about culture. And culture has its role. So when the Prophet, so I'll tell you about Istihsan. Let's go back historically. Let's go back to Omar. When he found out people were stealing from the treasury, and he said, okay, why are they stealing? So he understood there's a reason for this law. He, he went against the literal teaching of the Qur'an because he found that they were just poor people and were struggling as an economic situation. I'm the leader, I should feel responsible. This is beautiful leadership. He said, don't take their hand. These guys are not thieves like that. So when the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited in very strong terms, a man should not sell what he does not have possession of. That was the Prophet said that. 
when the Muslims, within literally 20 years of the Prophet's passing, in Persia it was very common that they had masari, places where they would manufacture lots of things, which is now commonplace. Back then it was weird to Arabia. And so then people would be known to be working as an agent for that place. And so Abu Hanifa and then all the scholars followed him after. They said, we can cancel that ruling because now we understand that there's a new reality that exists that negates that scriptural teaching. And so the point here is that people's wealth is preserved and what's known to be the result of the transaction based upon this new thing is there's no danger to people's wealth. So Islamic law is deep like that. It's not like whatever it says for all times and places it's the same. No scholar thinks like that. This is what's wrong with people who have honor killings and stuff is that they think they have an ayah or hadith and then they start, you know, thinking that this is how it should be, and they don't know the religion very well at all. And this is our big asthma. I mean, our big problem, our big disaster. So this is what that was. And then the last one, I think, because we are running out of time. وَالْمَرْأَةُ رَاعِيَةٌ عَلَى بَيْتِ بَعْلِهَا وَوَرْدِهِ وَيَا مَسْئُولَةٌ عَلَى God has, uh, you know, decreed that the woman is like a shepherd. She's a leader. The woman is a leader of her husband's house and his children. She's responsible for them in this life and the hereafter, the scholars said about the commentary. Every wise man knows it's her house. So he said, you're contradicting yourself. No, I'm saying, okay, there is a, there's a literal, there's a letter of the law and a spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is her house. Okay? The wife, she has to take care of it. She knows where everything's at. She's doing the stuff. This is her kitchen. What's she going to do? How she's going to do it? How she wants to decorate it and all that stuff. You just got to buy it and give her the credit card and give it, you know. It's very, very, very stupid to try to control all these things. The problem is I'm saying. It's her house. And it's her kids. The primary person to come with methods of raising and discipline should be. Unless the man says, here's an ayah hadith that conflicts with that. It should be the mother. The wife is the one making these rules. And then the man has to be on board with her and support that. You know, I've always learned it. Through. So, Baba, go ask your mom. <laughs> that saves you. Because you don't want to say something thinking you know what you're doing. And then she's like, I have told them. You know what I'm saying? It's her house and her kids, man. She, read, she gave birth. That one brother I was talking to him recently, he said, Okay, but the kids, you know, this and that, I'm going to name them. But this, I said, brother, she's carrying that thing in her belly. You got to just give in, man. You got to realize there's a, there's a time and a place to exercise some sort of an authority. This is not it. Yeah. Any general questions? Any questions? Yeah. So this is one of the, the many verses that's always taken out of context, and, and especially in media. So what would be the best response? I mean, especially given that the translation is always being done. Yeah. So how do you respond if someone confronts you and says, okay, well... So here's what we say. Because you don't have you don't have a five minute explanation <clears throat> point, right? So what you say is the Quran did reveal some things relative to some cultural inclinations of the people. There's no question about that. And some eyes have context. So two things. There was some sort of physical reprimand between a husband to or towards his wife that the way she would have received it, number one, she would not have felt abused in any way. She would just feel like, oh, stuff for Allah, I really offended my husband, he's, he's really upset with me, I, I don't want to be that wife who's, you know, uh, you know, rude or disrespectful or whatever to my wife. And so then she would calm down and everything would be fine, right? And she would come back to her senses. But for me as a person born and raised in, in our context, that's not how we solve the problem, and it doesn't make sense, and I don't see any role for it here. Now, number two to that is, the Prophet ﷺ never followed this example, which emphasizes that there was some contextual cultural application that he himself was exalted above. Because it's not that he did not have some recurring conflicts with in his home. It did happen. But in no time is there any narration that he ever hit any woman. So, uh, so that's that. But for sure... Islam is categorically in the commentary of this verse that abusing or beating or harming a wife is a crime, it is oppression, and in an Islamic court, you, she comes with bruises, you will come, and then some guy will bruise you, 
and punish you in public. Sure. Yeah. No, no, it has to be someone of his same uh, al <laughs> method. Has to be on the same level. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be a guy his size. Yeah. Another question. So, is it possible that you know when we believe that Quran is timeless, mm -hmm. and then we're talking about this verse, and we're saying it maybe culturally, it has context, you know, yeah. context, but maybe outdated. But then, would it be fair to also believe that maybe even though after 14, 1500 years, we don't quite comprehend? No, no, we understand. It. What I've said is we, we understand the ayah. And there are still places where it would be valid. So here's, the, here's why I started what I started where I started. The idea that modern culture in America of solving problems <coughs> is the divine truth of absolute perfection. That's false. That's false. Whatever people are doing today is something they're doing, I guarantee you, 100 years, they'll have very different ideas about what, what we're doing today. They'll see certain things that we're doing today as old and backward and not the right way. And they'll have new things that right now we would perceive that as strange. Just like, I'm telling you, if the pastor were to hit his wife 80 years ago in a similar context, not abusing her, but in some sort of a physical reprimand that is not abusive or violent, and she called the police people like, what are you talking about? Back then, and we're talking about like 60, 70 years probably in America. So this is really not the, the overemphasis that whatever we've come to conclude about what is the proper ethics and morals as an American society is some sort of divine revelation or some holy truth, we need to be careful from that. And that's why we have revelation, is to give us a reference point that we would know what is the way. So somebody might say, okay, Imam, then you have your Qur'an that says, well, the Quran, I'm telling you, the Qur'an I know has taught us many ways to do it. Two of them I see would be effective in my understanding here in this particular set. Other ayahs give me other means and other ways. Uh, so for example, the Surah Taghabun says, Ya yulidhani amru, inna min azwajikum wa ulajikum aduwwal lakum fahdaru wa in ta'fu wa tasfahu wa tawfiru fa inna Allah wa furu rahim. Oh, you who believe, you will find from your spouses and from your children like enemies. So be cautious of them. If you would be pardoning forgiving and overlooking for the things they do that bother you, then know that that is the way of God. That's another reason. That's how you, that's how, it makes perfect sense how to deal with the thing. So this one, culturally, it just doesn't fit with me. And I don't see it, even if I tried to do it, it will create problems, I know it. It's not going to work. Even if I went like this, you know, like that. I'm not hurting her. But she will see it in our culture as some sort of humiliation. She'll see, I'm an educated person, I'm no child. See, you have, we also have to understand, in the old Arab culture, the man, when he would give, I mean, I, I, no, I don't want to say that. I will say that, till now, across the world, there's this idea that I've raised my daughter up till now, and then when he talks to the prospective south, now I'm handing my daughter over to you. This is a cultural norm today. The idea that, I've raised her, this is my daughter, I've protected her, I've been Now you, son, you will have to play that role. You'll be her leader, you'll be her care for her and all of this. So that idea, and usually women would be much younger than the men that they married. That's a historical culture that's not the same today. Also, women back then were not educated. These are all things that play a role in how we understand the Qur'an. So we can understand the Qur'an contextually, and that is not a modern American thing. Let's be very careful to understand, these things I'm saying is not because I was raised here. These things are written in books before America existed, and they were written at the time in the Dark Ages when Europe was guillotines and head coming off, and people being burned at the stake and all that kind of stuff. Okay? So we have a very beautiful, rich, versatile system of law that isn't always going to be culturally popular and it's not always going to solve the cultural expectation. We should not stretch or change our religion to fit what people expect from us because then we're, we're being very dangerous in our testimony of faith. So there is versatility and liberal means of different interpretation and methodology and schools of thought within our tradition, but we have to stick within the mainstream.
We can't invent a new religion. No, some scholars may come up with a new fatwa, like many people keep asking them. Well, brother, what if, you know, my, my, my daughter wants to marry this guy, he's a really nice guy, but he's not Muslim. I said, like, no, no, I'm not doing this marriage. He's like, but you're an American. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with it. You're still not getting what I'm doing here. You don't understand it. There's no basis I have for that one. Because some UCLA or Georgetown or some strange lady called Irshad Manji made a big deal about this. I'm not going to follow them. They're not great scholars that are known and respected as mujtahideen. You're talking about inventing. Now, if some great scholars came out with that and they bring their thing and, they, and I looked at it and it makes sense, at that point, I could use it as a precedent. But right now we don't have any scholars saying that, and so, and you know, you have some places right now, some sister sent me a link yesterday. Some sheikh in Azhar busted out that you can drink alcohol as long as you don't get drunk. <laughs> I swear to God. This guy is a PhD in Sharia. So PhDs don't mean anything we just learned, okay? So, uh, and I can give many examples on that, about different opinions and actions that I've seen from people. So, uh, yeah, we have, to, we have a mainstream. And the Sunnah is a very vast, versatile, rich tradition that we should appreciate and, and uh, celebrate and come to know and understand. This is what we want to do in MCC, is to show, to see how it's vast. This idea that I'm this school of thought, these scholars from a long time ago, my family inherited to me how I should follow, and you better accommodate me and make, you know, follow up. Brother, come on, man, you can do whatever you want yourself, but don't tell me what to do. And please try to come learn and not be rigid and try to judge everybody according to some narrow, narrow-minded understanding of the religion. It's a, it's a beautiful religion if you come learn. Many people left the religion because of these things that you're doing, you know. So this is Allah.